My name is Brian Shea, and on we have George Garrett, City Manager as well. We're going to go over the local ordinances for Marathon as they will pertain to the Home Elevation Workshop. First and foremost, we have our heights criteria. City of Marathon in the last year or so updated our heights to account for the new flood maps. So now our maximum height was increased from 37 feet now to 42 feet. And that height is measured from the existing unimproved grade or crown of the road, whichever is greater. There are exceptions to this height. Those are usually for AC units or other minor structures that are architectural details. And we can address those on a case by case basis with permitting. Now, a lot of the homes that you will be working on elevating already have existing setbacks. So when you were looking at setback considerations, we're looking at the additions that are required with these elevations. So those would be any additional porches, decks, or stairs. Generally, those should be outside of the setbacks, and those setbacks um, are specific to zoning districts. So here you have the table showing all of our zoning districts with their required front, rear, and side setbacks. We do have exceptions for small lot parcels. So anything that is less than 4,500 square feet has a reduced setback of 10 feet for the front and rear. And then we have setbacks as they pertain to water bodies and wetlands. Now, again, if you have an existing structure, we are looking at that structure as existing and it may be non-conforming. We have a code section that allows for non-conforming setbacks to be maintained so long as they're not increased. So if you have a structure within the wetland setback or within the canal buffer setback, you can add the stairs just to the other portion of the home, not within the setback, which then goes into our building footprint considerations. The main point of the building footprint consideration is to maintain your 20% open space. And that's generally for scarified land, which all of these elevations would be developed or scarified lots, and to make sure that all stormwater is retained on site. So again, we have that exception for the setback for the area, so long as you maintain your stormwater on site. And in terms of the stormwater, we have a handy dandy residential checklist for you to do the calculations for your stormwater control. Now, many of these homes that are looking to be elevated may not have their original stormwater features. So when you come in for permitting for the elevation, we will look at the stormwater as if it is a new construction project. So you would use the new construction, whether or not you're adjacent to water body or not adjacent to water body, not the swale volume for new impervious. Just because a lot of these homes that are ground level are pre firm and they do not have the swales or other stormwater control that were put in place back in the 50s and 60s. Brian? Just that if you have any questions, contact the planning department. Our email is planning at ci.marathon.fl.us or just call the main line or my phone number. Hi, everyone. I'm Dave Turner, city administrator for the city of Key Colony Beach. Uh, welcome to this seminar. Key Colony Beach was actually formed in 1957, and it's an island that was actually formed, literally formed. They filled it all in, cut the canals, and ended up making a city. All our lots in Key Colony are unique in itself. Um, we do not participate in Rogo compared to the rest of Monroe County, which makes us very unique in our our building, our flood maps are the same throughout Monroe County. So if you look at the flood maps, we are listed in there and we do participate in all the flooding uh, issues. So it's the same here throughout the Keys, uh, the flooding issues. What is unique within Key Colony Beach, we just added two more feet of freeboard, which is going to help with our CRS ratings for uh, flood insurance, which is, we follow the state code, which is one foot, and we added two more feet within the city. So it's three foot total of freeboard. That's one of the main issues in Key Colony. As far as any of your questions, everything that it's, you see in these different modules, except the local towns, Marathon, Key West, Layton, um, applies to Key Colony. Very good information. And you know when you read it, 
and listen to it. Follow if you have any questions, contact Firm or Allison. Uh, they all have very, very good information. The um, easiest way in Key Colony, we have a very uh, builder and development friendly building department. Call them or make an appointment. They'll walk you through everything and give you all the information. Because we are so, so small, we only have 12 streets, seven miles worth of roads. And during busy season, there's about 3,000 people in town uh, for the owners. So we are, again, super unique. So if you do live in Key Colony and you have any questions, please call our building department. Um, the number is 305-289-1212 and extension two, and they will get you into the building department. And that would be Gerard Rosen. And our building inspector is Greg Lawton. And they would actually, if you own a property, you want to do a remodel or you want to lift your property, they'll actually come out to your property and do a site visit and help you with all the paperwork and give you any idea or the information you need to go on and lift your single family home that's on the ground, help you with where to go to for a grant possibly, or if you're doing a remodel on a house that's already up and you want to lift it a little more to get that free board, uh, they're very, very helpful. Um, and that is everything that I have as far as uniqueness. All our setbacks, I can go through each one, but we have R1A, R2A. And if your lot is irregular because the way they developed the city itself, each lot has a different setback. So again, it's easiest just to go to our building official. They'll come out and look at your property and say, it's five foot, five foot, 20 in the back. 20 from the center of the road, the crown of the road, if you're on a canal or different. So it's best just to contact our building office with all your questions. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Mimi Young. I'm with Tom Bray, our building code administrator in the city of Layton. And I am his designee for flood plain management and we'll get through this together. Uh, the first thing we wanted to discuss were the height considerations in the city of Layton. We do have a mandatory three foot of freeboard added to the established base flood elevation indicated on the current uh, flood insurance rate map. Layton has a maximum 30 foot building height throughout the city. Layton only allows one floor of habitable floors in all districts except commercial, which allows two habitable floors. Layton allows no more than 300 square feet of enclosed area below, base flood elevation plus three foot of freeboard. This area is not allowed any utilities, except for a ceiling light and a GFI switch near the entry door and can only be used for storage, parking, or entrance to the main home. Layton currently has no historical structures. As far as permeable conditions and considerations, uh, this the maximum lot coverage is as follows, and I'll try to get through the asterisks and everything. Uh, the single family zoning is 35% of the total lot coverage. Um, but there, there is an asterisk that allows an additional 800 square foot per 5,000 square foot of land area or prorated fraction thereof impervious areas shall include but not limited to your drain fields, concrete, roof, overhangs, docks, and the like. This is only for the single family, not commercial. Multifamily is 35% or a maximum of 1,750 square feet of the lot. Commercial allows up to 60% impervious surface ratio face out. And the conservation area is 50% and public use is 40%. I added the setback considerations with the asterisks because they are so important. Um, 
And again, it'll show you the your front side and rear. It's basically with 99% of all our uh, lots in the residential area mm -hmm. is 20 feet in the front, five feet on both sides. And that includes the canal, uh, 10 feet if you're up against the natural Zane Gray Creek area or a dry lot in the commercial side. A uh, multi-family is 25 feet with 10 feet on the sides and in the rear. Commercial, 10 feet uh, with five feet on your sides and 15 feet in the rear. Conservation is 10 feet, five feet from the sides and 15 and 20 feet from Bangray Creek and 20 feet from the wetlands. And public use is 10 feet from the front five from the sides and 15 from the rear. Down below on this is very important, uh, altered shoreline versus unaltered shoreline. Those setbacks go from 20 to 50 feet. And this, these are the setbacks, considerations and the exceptions and footnotes to those rules, which I basically went over. Building footprint considerations, Layton's only footprint consideration would be in the V zone areas, specified on the current flood insurance rate map. Other development in coastal high hazard areas, zone V, in, in uh, the development activities other than buildings and structures shall be permitted only if also authorized by the appropriate federal, state, or local authority. If located outside the footprint of and not structurally attached to buildings and structures, and if analysis prepared by qualified registered design professionals demonstrate no harmful division of floodwaters or wave runoff and wave reflection that would increase damage to addition adjacent buildings and structures. Such other development activities include but are not limited to bulkheads, seawalls, retaining walls, revetments, and similar erosion control structures, solid fences and privacy walls, fences prone to trapping debris, unless designed and constructed to fail under flood conditions less than designed flood or otherwise function to avoid obstruction of floodwaters. And thirdly, on-site sewage treatment and disposal systems divine defined in 64E-6.002 of the FAC as field systems or mound system. If you have any questions, we'd be happy to answer them. A lot of information. Thank you. That's wonderful, Mimi. And, and I, I really do appreciate all of the, it's the, the more information, the better is, you know, always, always helps folks out. Uh, where can they get in touch with you? They can reach us, us both at City Hall. We're located at 68280 Overseas Highway uh, in Long Key, right next to the firehouse. Or you can email City Hall at cityoflayton.com. Or you can give us a call at 305-664-4667. And you can always visit our website at cityoflayton.com. Good evening, my name is Christine Hurley and I have with me here today, Carl Bursa, um, Monroe County floodplain administrator. And we're gonna talk to you about some considerations that need to be made if you decide to move forward with elevating your home. Um, as stated earlier, it can be confusing, but all of the cities and the county are really interested in this subject and we're trying to really focus on helping homeowners get through the process. So I'm going to turn it over to Carl and he's going to explain to you how to find out how high you should elevate your home. Carl? Good evening everybody. Thank you very much. 
So my name is Carl Bursa. I'm the Senior Floodplain Administrator for Monroe County. And what you have in front of you on the screen is a, an app that we have developed uh, through our GIS department and uh, our GIS guru, Brian Davison, a three-panel app that shows you your existing flood zone and design flood elevation. The flood zone and design flood elevation that would be uh, headed toward you if the FEMA floodplain uh, preliminary floodplain maps are adopted as they are proposed, and then Woods Hole Group, our uh, our appeal consultants, and their appeal um, map that you're going to see on the far and and so you're looking at this, it's left to right, what you are, what FEMA is proposing, and what Woods Hole Group's appeal would be if the appeal is accepted. Um, on the left-hand side, you're going to see we have the comparison link right there, and then right beneath it, you have the South Florida Water Management Datum Conversion Link. One of the important things to remember about the adoption of the new maps is that not only are we changing the maps, the datum that we're using to calculate mean sea level is also being changed. As a, as a general rule of thumb, the negative impact is about minus 1.4 feet from what your existing grade is. The property in question that you're looking at, the little red box right there, if you can take a look, you're going to notice that it is right now in an AE flood zone with a base flood elevation of 10. Right now, Monroe County GIS shows that uh, existing grade at approximately 3.5 feet NGVD, which means that in order for this flood, this house to be compliant with, with a current base flood elevation, excuse me, design flood elevation, it would have to go to 7.5 feet above existing grade and have the finished floor elevation at that elevation where your feet sit in order for it to be compliant with flood. Now, when you look at the next pane, <clears throat> the center pane in, the, in this case, which has your the, the FEMA proposed preliminary maps, you're going to notice that this has a little bit of a yellow shading to the new zone area. That's because this is going to a VE, Victor Edward flood zone, with the base flood elevation of 11 feet and a design flood elevation of 12 feet. This is important because the V zone, not and now instead of having a finished floor elevation where your feet are, now you actually need to go to the bottom of the beam that supports the lowest, the lowest floor. So you lose anywhere from 12 to 18 inches, depending on the thickness of your, of your uh, lower beam. In addition to that, with the datum conversion, what you're going to see is you're going to see a lower a flood, a lower um, floor elevation here, or so, excuse me, a lower ground elevation here. Your ground elevation for this property now goes from 3.5 foot NGBD to 2 feet NAVD 88, which is the new datum. This means that your lowest horizontal structural member is now going to be set 9 feet above existing grade in order for you to be compliant with base flood. And then you're going to have to add an extra foot of freeboard so it would be 10 feet up to be where your lowest horizontal structural member would need to be per Florida building code in ASCE 24. The final thing that you're going to see, and this is actually a really good representation of what of one of our new features on the new maps, you're going to see that the red box is in the AE zone again. However, you're going to see a line that looks like a little weather front line with those little triangles. That is the limits of moderate wave action or LIMWA line. Anything that is constructed or reconstructed behind this line means that you now have to comply with VE flood zone standards, even though you are in an AE flood zone for insurance purposes. So with this, you're also going to see that Woods Hole Group in their data, in their data you're going to see, have lowered the flood zone here from, excuse me, lowered the base flood elevation to 10 and lowered the design flood elevation to 11. So with the new datum conversion in place, what this means is that you are still going to have to elevate, but you won't have to elevate as much in order to be compliant, but you will still be elevating to the lowest horizontal structural member and not the finished floor elevation because in the coastal AE flood zone behind the limits of moderate wave action line, you're required by Florida building code to build to VE flood zone standards. So what's going to wind up happening is you're going to go from what you would have had, which would have been an, a 10 foot elevation to the lowest horizontal structural down to a nine foot elevation to the lowest horizontal structural member in order to be compliant with your design flood elevation. And again, if, on the left hand side, you're going to see a very clear uh, county where our county map comparison link is and this South Florida water management data conversion. All you have to do is click in the, in the boxes there. You can type in your real estate ID number, your parcel ID number, or your own, the owner name, and it will pull it right to that section.
and thank you very much. Thanks, Carl. So that sounds super complicated, but the good news is Carl Bursa, as well as a couple other county staff members are always available to help you. And in reality, if you call him up and tell him your address, he can help coach you and talk to you and figure out where you would need to elevate to to meet the actual uh, code requirements. The other thing that Allison mentioned earlier is if you're willing to go higher than the minimum required, you can get additional flood insurance discounts. And as she stated, if you go all the way to three foot above the minimum required, that will give you your maximum discount. And I think um, it's very important that you work with your insurance agent to find out those different discounts because that'll help you make your decision on how you want to design your elevation. <clears throat> so trying to, oops, sorry about that. So when you go um, to get your permits for the elevation, you're going to have considerations related to permitting. And a lot of people are concerned because in Monroe County, height limitations are kind of like the holy grail um, as far as code. And in unincorporated Monroe, we have a 35 foot maximum height limit for new construction. However, our commission recognized the need to allow some flexibility in that rule if someone is willing to take on elevating an existing structure. And so what they've done is adopted some, some code amendments that actually allow you to go up to five feet above the 35 height limit, up to 40 feet, if you elevate three feet above the FEMA base flood elevation. So they recognize the maximum insurance discount and they're giving a height incentive so you can not get caught up in whether or not your elevation will exceed the height limit. The other thing they've done is for new construction to incentivize that to go higher than the minimum they will give you up to 38 feet so you can get that X if you elevate an extra three feet. Again, trying to maximize the insurance discount. We have long definitions for what height is and how you measure it. I'm not going to read this to you, but the bottom line is that you get to begin the measurement either at the crown of the road or your natural elevation of your private property, whichever is higher. And you measure from that point all the way up to the top of the highest point of the structure. This diagram kind of shows you um, what it would be like for a home that starts out at a five foot beginning of the elevation. So the crown of the road is at five feet. You can see each story can be 10 feet. That's a average height of a floor in a residential structure. That doesn't accommodate 12 foot ceilings and all some of the dramatic um, architectural designs that are being done today, but it would allow five feet for your roof pitch. Um, Often in unincorporated, that first 10 feet, people drive their cars under and park, and then they'll have a two-story house of, of over and above the um, parking. I already talked about the difference between new construction and existing construction, and this is about elevating existing structures. So I think it's very important to note that the existing structures can elevate up to a higher amount, 40 feet maximum. 
I'm not going to go over this at all in detail, but if you're really considering elevating, we can send you this diagram for you to study and it'll help you get an idea of how it works. And what's very important is to look at the bottom and see where the measurement starts from. So oftentimes we will help you individually if you're gonna pursue a permit to get to this point. Now, what's really important and we're really excited about is that our commission knows that under the new FEMA maps that Carl went over, the elevations that are required are most likely getting higher, which makes sense because flood risk is higher, sea level rise is an issue in our community. So we are processing or working on code amendments that would actually let things change and be accommodated and more flexible if you're in that situation and your flood zone goes up. The other thing to consider is when you elevate a structure, current code has setback requirements, open space requirements, drainage and parking requirements that your existing home might not meet. So let's say your home was built during the time where setbacks were not as strict. Under today's code, if you are gonna spend more than 50% of the value of the structure to elevate, then you're expected to meet all the existing codes. That makes things very difficult. And staff right now are working with the county commission. In July, we will be seeking approval to process a code amendment that would allow us to recognize existing setbacks and existing open space for structures that are gonna be elevated. And that way you wouldn't have a whole host of challenges during permitting. So that's something we're working on. And that's pretty much it as far as uh, Monroe County code requirements for elevating. Uh, hi, I'm Allison Higgins, the Sustainability Coordinator for the City of Key West, and I'll be summarizing some key city ordinances and resources which you might need to consider. Uh, first and foremost, how high do you need to go and where do you look it up? To find out what flood zone you are in, start here at the Key West floodplain management page, which is within the building department. It has a wealth of information about flood maps, elevation certificates, insurance, etc. You will also uh, find out what flood zone you're currently in. The number next to the letter will tell you the height of your base flood elevation, again, commonly referred to as BFE. The higher the number, the higher you'll need to elevate. A zones and B zones have different rules too, which the website can tell you more about. The city website also has a link that compares the impact of FEMA's preliminary rate maps. On the left is FEMA's new proposed map. In response, many of our key local governments and firm are challenging the models that FEMA use to come up with their maps and have offered this version on the right as an alternate. The city's webpage titled New Flood Maps has a short video explaining our appeal and how to use the map viewer. As of June 2021, all of us are waiting on the final outcome. This is one reason you might want to wait on elevation. It would be horrible to think you would raise the maximum insurance savings just to have FEMA move the line on you. If you are signed up for Firm's e-newsletter, you'll receive updates on this important issue. I also encourage you to watch Monroe County's video for a demonstration of their map viewer, which shows all three scenarios, current, proposed, and challenge, side by side for any keys property. On height and insurance. So you know what zone you're in, how high should you go? First, you should consider insurance. In this example, Based on past rates and an initial first floor elevation of three feet below BFE, each foot above BFE gives increased insurance savings as seen here. These extra feet above BFE are known as freeboard. Note that one foot freeboard, which is one foot above BFE, is the minimum elevation per floor of building code. And that three foot of freeboard or three feet above BFE 
is the maximum level that insurance will give credit for. For some zones, the maximum building height might make it hard to raise a house. This example in the single family zone is in, in an AE6 flood zone and has a max height of 25 foot. The city's building height exemption rule allows both existing and new homes to exceed their max height cap for every foot that the building is raised above BFE up to four foot of freeboard. In this case, a home on the ground, when the ground is four foot and BFE is six foot, will need to elevate their first hovel floor to at least seven foot as Florida building code known as BFE plus one. If this home is already 25 feet high, it would be allowed to go above the maximum height by at least the three feet to get to code and up to seven foot if they wanted to achieve BFE plus the four foot of freeboard that the exemption allows. The city has two great videos about our building height exemption and the insurance savings from the extra freeboard and a guideline document that goes through all the aspects of the building height exemption. The city's historic preservation staff and the historic architectural review commission known as HARC are highly supportive of protecting our historic buildings from damaging floods and long-term sea level rise. To that end, historic buildings require an extra level of permission from HARC because the mass and the scale of neighboring buildings also figure into an individual elevation. You may need to mask the elevation change with planting bases and double skirt boards. Also, the space for stairs is often an issue and HARC is prepared to work with you if your property doesn't have the room as in this recent example on Caroline Street, which allows stair intrusion into the historic porch, uh, the, the diagram on the right. A building height certificate is needed at the time of application uh, and new construction may need to minimize their floor to ceiling heights as new construction cannot outsize the, his the surrounding historic buildings. All right, so let's keep talking about stairs. Even when you are not a historic property, the extra space needed for stairs and porches that connect your elevated door to the ground will add to your building's coverage and the imperviousness of, the, of your property, like in this fill-in example from Third and Patterson. The maximum lot coverage for most single-family properties is 35%, with other zones ranging from 40 to 50. How do you know what yours is for sure? First, Find out what zone you're in from the city's planning department website. Website, <laughs> look for the zoning map. Then also in the department page, look up your zone rules in the land development regulations, commonly referred to as LDRs, chapter 122 on zoning. Also in chapter 122 of the LDRs, that's where your zone's maximum height is listed and your maximum impervious surface ratio. This is the percent of your lot that doesn't allow water to seep back into the ground. Your building coverage is part of that, but your driveway, pavers, patios, etc., also count towards that. Single family zone is 50% maximum impervious, and most others are 60%. This property has many features that would count towards imperviousness. This property also has setback issues which is the minimum space required between your house and the perimeter edge of your property. The minimum setback numbers are also found in your zone's LDRs. As you can see here on this corner lot, the west side of the house, well, as you can't see, but the west side of this house has a door that opens five foot from the neighbor's property line. If stairs or a walkway are added from that door on that side, it would intrude into that minimum side setback of five foot. Long story short, on this house, which is mine, uh, we've already removed many of the pavers and all of the patio decking you see here, and we are considering whether to shift the house or no longer have that doorway. We have learned that once the house is in the air, the additional cost to shift it on the property isn't that much more costly. Uh, this brings us to our last major uh, point, which is about downstairs enclosures. Uh, if you're able to raise high enough to put in a downstairs enclosure and you wish to create a enclosed space below there, there are two paths. If you needed the building height exemption, you're eliminated 299 square feet of enclosure. If you did not need the exemption, there is no limited size uh, except for the footprint of your house. 
for both paths, the enclosure can only be used for storage, parking, and access for the first floor. No one can live down there. It would also need flood vents, which will allow the storm surge to flow through the space, and it has to use flood-resistant materials. You cannot have interior finishes like drywall, paneling, or flooring that would get soaked. Uh, note that simple privacy fencing around your underneath area does not count as an enclosed space. This wraps up the overview. Besides the bounty of information on each department page, you can also sign up for notification from the city as we strive to adapt to our changing climate. Thank you all for watching.